Hello and welcome to this final educational session of the 2021 Modern Hydronic Summit. My name is Doug Picklick, editor of HPAC Magazine, and I'm joined today by regular HPAC contributors and well-known hydronics industry experts, John Siegenthaler and Robert Bean, together known as Siggy and the Bean. This session is a revival of the duo's Things We'd Like to See session, updated for 2021. I'd like to recognize the sponsor of this session, and that's Viesman. Thank you to Viesman, and thank you to the hundreds of registrants who are attending this year's virtual Modern Hydronics Summit. Now, one last time, this final session is a recording, but for everyone joining us here at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday, March 31st, both John and Robert are online with you. So please feel free to write your message into the public session chat to the right of this screen. Not <laughs> sure. And they'll be responding in real time. Okay. Now that we're up to speed, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ziggy and the Bean. Take it away. Well, thanks, Doug. Um, I am joining you from upstate New York, uh, certainly hoping to get back up to Canada at some point. Uh, always enjoy the Canadian audiences, and we find a lot of interest in hydronics up there. So uh, our session today are, is about things that we'd like to see uh, developing in the industry. And I think between Robert and myself, we've got a pretty broad spectrum of ideas here. And uh, I'm gonna go first, I, I will give you three topics uh, that I'd like to see, and then we're gonna switch over and Robert will fill in. And Robert, certainly feel, feel free to jump in here on any, uh, any of the slides. Yeah, you bet. Okay. So um, my topics, uh, these are pretty much related to where hydronic systems, um, I think, are headed in the future, uh, in particular with uh, heat pumps becoming a larger and a larger segment of the industry. Uh, and they're specific. Uh, the first one is a way to properly insulate a circulator uh, for use in a chilled water system. And I'll, and I'll show you why that's really important. Um, another topic is buffer tanks. And of course, buffer tanks have been around for quite a while, but uh, they're in different configurations. We see sometimes buffer tanks that are, in a sense, shoehorned into a system. They don't necessarily have the right location or the right size of connections. So one of the things that I've, I've tried to work through is what would be a universal buffer tank design that could be applied in a lot of different types of systems and then finally, uh, a new one is an interior air to water heat pump, which sounds like a contradiction of terms, but I'll show you that these products actually do exist in, uh, in the European market and there are some uh, interesting benefits to them. So vapor tight, we'll start with this, vapor tight insulation shells on circulators. Uh, I mentioned heat pumps. I, I really think with the global trend towards decarbonization and slow but sure progress away from fossil fuels and towards electrified systems, we're going to see heat pumps increase market share as not only heat sources, but as chill water sources in smaller scale hydronic systems. And it's going to be a major uh, game changer in terms of one of the weaknesses of hydronics traditionally has been that it doesn't do cooling. Typically it's been a separate system. Well both geothermal water to water heat pumps as well as air to water heat pumps now bring that ability. And with it comes the, the infrastructure that we need to create, the, in, in particular, the proper use of pipe insulation and pre, uh, preventing condensation in places where we don't want it. And one of the most difficult areas is the volute of a circulator. And uh, you can see in the photos over there on the right, and I'm going to show you some more, uh, the circulator volutes can corrode quite rapidly when that circulator is operating with chilled water. 
And this corrosion isn't just limited to the volute, it'll actually migrate up onto the isolation flanges, even the zinc coated hardware that's used to hold the flanges to the uh, circulator. So we, uh, we need a product that can solve that. Uh, here's a couple more shots over here on the right. There's a circulator that was uh, actually part of a geothermal system. And if you take a close look at that, you'll see the volute and those isolation flanges are covered with condensation. Uh, you don't see it on the motor can. The motor can is actually dissipating enough heat that it is remaining above the dew point temperature and it's, it's not uh, experiencing condensation. Uh, the photo here in the middle, uh, that's a circulator that's actually only been in service for about one season. And that circulator did have some type of a coating on it. it it's not a raw cast iron um, volute. It does have some type of a paint coating on it, but you can see it's not been that effective against condensation. And again, you'll start to see stains like this. Uh, and I wanna stress that the, the condensation isn't just limited to the circulator. It's going to drip off that circulator and if the circulator is above any type of wood or drywall, anything like that, uh, anything that's below it is going to get stains on it. So uh, again, the geometry of these volutes makes it somewhat difficult, but there are products on the market in other, I should say in other markets, so a limited amount in the North American market at this point that does make it easier to insulate that complex geometry on that volute. Now, a condensation is going to occur whenever a surface drops below the dew point temperature of the surrounding air. And that's a function of both the dry bulb temperature of the air and the relative humidity of the air. And there's a couple ways, actually there's more than two, but a couple easy ways to determine what that dew point temperature is. You can use the graph over here on the left where we've got different lines set up here for different relative humidities and then the dry bulb temperature down at the bottom. So basically we find a dry bulb temperature like 75 degrees. And in this example, I go up to 50% uh, relative humidity and we're right around 55 degree dew point. So again, imagine we're dealing with chilled water at 45, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. We're below that dew point temperature. And again, any surface that that air can get in contact with uh, when it's below the dew point is going to have condensation forming. Uh, of course, today there's all kinds of online calculators. Uh, I just went into Google and typed in dew point calculator and this came up. Uh, it's a pretty simple tool. You put in again, the dry bulb temperature, relative humidity, and you can see it, it agrees with the chart over here. We're at a dew point of about 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So getting to this temperature is pretty easy. Uh, you might be thinking, well, suppose, you know, suppose uh, I'm in an arid climate. Uh, there is, it's very likely that under some combination of conditions, you're going to get uh, a situation where the chill water temperature or the surface temperature of that volute is going to get below the dew point, even in arid climates. It may not occur as often as it would in a more humid climate, but the idea that you can go without um, insulation, uh, eventually you're going to see the, those volutes corrode the way I've, I've shown you. Now, I just want to show you, I, I went on again on a search and these are different pump manufacturers. So certainly some of them you recognize as products or at least manufacturers that have a presence in North America. Uh, in the European market, the use of insulation shells not only on circulators, but other hydronic components like air separators, hydraulic separators, and so forth, it's, it's much more common. Um, I'm not sure if that is a requirement by regulation. I suspect it probably is, and maybe a requirement based on heating system regulations. Uh, these insulation shell products that you see here, you can see they all cover the glute of the circulator. None of them cover the motor, which is important. We don't want to insulate the motor. Uh, doing so, especially if that circulator is also uh, at times carrying heated water, uh, you could damage the circulator. The other thing I want you to notice is that these insulation shells, even though they do fit the geometry of the glute, they're not an airtight 
shell to that glute. You can see there's seams. Uh, there's an opening, for example, over here between the, um, the material of the circulator and that insulation shell. And it's important to seal those openings up. Once those insulation shells are in place, either an expanding foam or perhaps if it's a seam, something like a silicone caulk, uh, the key idea is to keep the air away from contact with a surface that's below the dew point. So the, the idea of insulation shells, it's not that they don't exist, it's that they're very limited at this point in the North American market. Now, um, here's, a, here's a couple base-mounted pumps with some uh, strainers on there and, and some other pipe fittings. And uh, one of the ways that you can deal with this is buy lots and lots of foam tape and wrap it around the, the piping. Uh, that works, but you can see that's a lot of work. And if you have to access that volute at some point or that some of the other fittings, uh, it's a lot of uh, work that has to be undone and then redone. Okay. Um, the one product, and, and again, my focus is primarily on, on residential light commercial hydronic systems. The one product that does exist in the market right now is from Grunfuss. The Alpha Circulator is available with an insulation shell. Uh, down here in the lower right, you can see it opened up. It's basically just a pre-molded two-piece shell that, that kind of loosely snaps together. Uh, again, you'll see seams and you'll see areas here where uh, the flange bolts go through. That's still somewhat of a weak point. Uh, it does need to have something over it to, to really protect uh, the, not only the, the volute, but the isolation flange and the piping uh, from condensation. So I'll move on. Another topic here, a universal design for a buffer tank. So I put down a lot of uh, items here on a wish list for buffer tanks. Uh, and we'll take a look at some of these, uh, able to accommodate different piping configurations. Um, I'm always a, a strident fan of high R value on buffer tanks. Um, I don't personally feel that the industry has enough insulation on some of these tanks at this point. Uh, standard typically is about two inches of a polyurethane. That's roughly an R12 insulation. Uh, it's certainly adequate to prevent condensation and it, it does limit heat loss. But if you think about situations where energy is stored, heat is being stored, especially at higher temperatures, perhaps from a pellet boiler or a cordwood gasification boiler, and you're trying to store this heat for maybe a day or two days, um, you know, the idea that a tank that loses one degree Fahrenheit an hour do the math over 24 hours, that's a pretty, pretty significant drop in, in uh, energy content. Uh, we want to encourage temperature stratification. If you look at the graphic there, you'll see the red up at the top is representing the hottest water in the tank. The blue at the bottom is the cooler water. And thermodynamically, that is preferred over a mixed tank. And, and it's going to use one of Robert's favorite words here, exergy. <laughs> We, we could say that that tank has got, the, the exergy of that tank is, is definitely preferred over a fully mixed tank. So uh, we want to be careful as we introduce flow into a tank that we don't internally mix the tank any more than absolutely uh, unavoidable. Uh, it should be able to handle water temperature up to 200 degrees. A lot of our modern hydronic systems are not going to go to that temperature the exception being uh, perhaps electric thermal storage applications with off-peak electric rates, or uh, again, uh, uh, biomass boilers, pellet boilers, wood gasification boilers, they can approach those temperatures. Uh, the term close couple, this simply means a way to put two of these tanks together. Uh, if one of these tanks is not large enough to provide the, you know, the calculated amount of storage, we want a way to use multiple tanks and bring them together fairly easily without uh, putting a lot of money into valving, uh, unions, piping, and so forth. Uh, multiple sensor wells, in some cases, we want to sense temperature gradients from top to bottom and make control decisions based on those temperature gradients. Uh, we want this tank to have low pressure drop, and of course, any tank, the shell of the tank itself, 
is going to have low pressure drop in. Think of a, a tank that's 30 inches in diameter and you know at 10 gallons a minute, that flow velocity is, is very, very low. And uh, there's virtually you know insignificant head loss. But we wanna pay attention to the connections up here. Uh, we don't want to cause inadvertently a high pressure drop at our connection points. And the reason for that is we want this tank to be able to function as a hydraulic separator in many systems. It can provide benefits beyond just thermal mass. Uh, monolithic insulation, especially in chilled water applications, uh, it is uh, every bit as important as what we talked about with the circulator volutes. We don't want moisture-laden air to get in contact with uh, certainly the shell of that tank or uh, the transition from the tank shell out to the connected piping. Um, I put down here, able to fit through a 36 inch doorway. Uh, you know, you make a tank that's 37 inches or um, 40 inches in diameter, uh, you're gonna have difficulty in getting that, especially in retrofit applications. A 36 inch doorway today is somewhat standard. Obviously in, in older houses, you may have some narrower tanks, but we need to pick some number as, as a criteria there. And in most of these cases, it can be just carbon steel uh, to keep the cost down. Of, of course, stainless steel is nice. It does certainly increase the price of the tank, but primarily these tanks are being applied in closed hydronic systems. They would be pressure rated. And again, I believe in Canada as well as in the States, once they get over 119 gallons, uh, they do need to have ASME certification. Yeah. John, I would just yes. add on those uh, tanks, you know, because um, you mentioned the word extra G, so now I'm paying attention, <laughs> that, uh, you know, as we move away from uh, combustion-based systems, uh, you know, obviously there's going to be a lower temperature, but there is, you know, of course, the, and I'm hoping, and I think probably share this thought that we'll see more uh, solar thermal systems, maybe a resurgent of solar thermal systems coming back. And those temperatures easily can get above 200 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, so, you know, these tank temperatures are important. But, the, you know, the message on Extra G, of course, is that a solar thermal system is much more aligned with the demands of, say, a 100 degree water temperature yeah. than the combustion based systems, which are starting out with, you know, 3,400 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,700 degrees C. So, yep. yeah, I, I, I'm hoping, I don't know, do you hope that we're going to see more th solar thermal? Well, I, it, I think we're going to see it in certain applications. Um, yeah. the, the solar photovoltaic market has really taken a lot of the wind out of the sails on solar thermal at this point. Sure has. The cost reduction. But we, we are still seeing applications for it. Uh, domestic water is still a good load profile for solar thermal. Uh, in the States, we're seeing it more in... For example, military installations uh, for larger domestic water applications. So, yeah, your your point's well taken. Uh, 200 degree water is certainly possible with a solar thermal system. And you know, again, we we try to establish some kind of a threshold. What what is our insulation good for? Uh, the tank shell itself, a carbon steel tank shell, should have no problem at 200 degrees. But the insulation that's used on it is we want to make sure we aren't causing degradation or outgassing on that insulation. So um, here is a classic piping configuration for a buffer tank. We, we call this a four pipe configuration. Basically, we've got a loop over here on the left where we have a heat source and we're putting heat into the tank. And then we have another circuit over on the right, which is some type of a load, <clears throat> excuse me. And you know this tank could work fine in this type of application. Um, the, the one drawback, significant drawback of a four pipe configuration is that all energy from the heat source to the load has to pass through the tank. Now, if the tank is being maintained at reasonable temperatures relative to what the load needs, that's really not a problem. The problem occurs when you're, you're letting your tank cool down substantially and trying to expedite heat from the heat source over to the load. You're, there's no way to disengage the thermal mass of the tank in a process like that. Still, thousands of systems have been piped up like this, and I, I don't wanna say don't use this, it's simply one of multiple configurations. Um, 
Here's another four pipe arrangement. I'm just showing you that the tank design that I'm, I'm showing here has some flexibility. The very hottest water is at the top of that tank. Uh, we have seen this with pellet boiler systems where a connection that's a foot lower than where the top shell uh, seam is in the tank actually is several degrees cooler than the water at the very top of the tank. So if you're trying to extract the very warmest water, perhaps in a heat pump application, where we're, we're trying to minimize how hot we force that heat pump to operate, we could take the uh, water right off the top of the tank and we could return it to the bottom. And with this bottom return, it is important that we have a baffle in the tank. Without that baffle, you're gonna create, if you will, a, a fountain inside that tank. You're gonna, if you could kind of imagine a glass tank with clear water in it, and then just you, you inject some nice dark blue dye into this water, and you watch what happens as that dyed water comes into the tank. Without the baffle, you're gonna see mixing well up into the, the main body of that tank, destroying that temperature stratification, or certainly taking the stratification in the wrong direction. Uh, and again, we've, we've done quite a bit of work over the last few years with pellet boiler systems, and we have seen this. And we, we've also seen that putting a circular baffle plate in, and you'll see the baffle doesn't go all the way across. There's anywhere from two to three inches of space between the periphery of that baffle and the inside of the tank. And that's done so, again, the velocities crossing above and below the baffle are low. So we're, we're minimizing mixing in the tank, but it also gives us the option, and I, I've got a drawing coming up, where we could inject hot water vertically into the top of the tank. And the, the baffle just uh, basically, it's, the, uh, it's this scenario down here where the flow comes in, strikes the baffle and more or less moves out horizontally, slows down and then moves up through that annular space, okay? Now here's another couple uh, configurations. These are both uh, what I call two pipe configurations. I had no idea that a buffer tank could be connected this way up until maybe 10 years ago, we started doing some work with NYSERDA and we started looking at European pellet boiler systems. And I used to look at their schematics and say, I, I understand everything, but they screwed up on the buffer tank piping. And it turned out that uh, I was the one that didn't recognize some of the, the benefits. Uh, the difference with a two pipe configuration is the load is being connected between the heat source and the tank. And that gives us a couple uh, nice benefits. Uh, one of the benefits is uh, what I call direct to load heat transfer. If the heat source and the load are operating at the same time, that won't always be true, but there certainly are gonna be times when it will be true. It is possible to send the hottest water coming off the heat source directly out to the load without having to pass it through the thermal mass of the tank, okay? That is a benefit, especially if that tank is cool at a startup condition or perhaps recovery out of a setback condition. The other benefit of a two pipe is that, for example, if I put some numbers on it, let's say we have 10 gallons a minute coming in from our heat source and we have eight gallons per minute going out to our load, that only leaves two gallons per minute going into the tank. So under those conditions, it does reduce the flow velocity that's entering the tank. And again, uh, helps maintain stratification within the tank, all right? Now, when you do that, when you do a two pipe, it is very important that you're controlling your heat source using a temperature sensor in the tank, not a thermostat up here. Uh, because you, uh, another scenario I can give you is, let's say the flow rate coming from the heat source is the same as the flow rate or very close to the flow rate going to the load. You can see what's going to happen. The buffer tank is essentially non, it's a non-participant at that point. Uh, and, and it's an expensive wide spot in the pipe is what we used to refer to when, it's, when the thermal mass is not being engaged in the, in the overall process. So if you do go with a two pipe configuration, make sure you're controlling your heat source based on um, the temperature in the tank. That could be a set point with a differential or it could be outdoor reset control. Um, one other configuration, and this is really just a variation 
this is where we're using a variable speed injection pump. These have been around for, gosh, Robert, what, 25 years now, I think, variable speed injection mixing. Yeah. Um, and it gives you the ability to not only transfer heat to a load, but also do it using outdoor reset as your temperature criteria up here, or again, it could be a set point. But notice that these T's are very close to this tank. That's another important detail. That allows the tank to act as a hydraulic separator between this circulator and this circulator. So this could be running at 25% speed. This could be running at full speed. And because from this point through the tank down to this point, we have very low pressure drop. We're getting a high degree of hydraulic separation there. So the tank is doing double duty for us, thermal mass plus hydraulic separation. John, I just want to comment on that. And one of the nice things about that is it does drop, I would think the return temperature <clears throat> lower back through the heating device, thus improving its efficiency rather than having to go through the tank. Is that it? A, does. In, yeah. in particular with, um, with heat pumps, um, we want to get that lowest water temperature going back to the, uh, back to the heat pump for the highest COP. Yeah. So now here's, uh, here's just another variation on it. This is where we've got two tanks in a close coupled arrangement side by side. And one of the uh, coupling devices that's on the market right now it's made by a company called Metroflex. And I'm, I'm sure most of you know what a fern co fitting is. Um, I want to caution you this is not a fern co fitting. Don't put a fern co fitting on a tank that's designed to go up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit and maybe 30 psi pressure. But it is a flexible coupling that has stainless steel bands around it to give it some pressure rating. And it's also got a, a much better clamping system. And it can actually be used as if you will a slip coupling you can have a couple short pieces of pipe that thread into the tank and uh, when you bring two tanks like this close together remember these might not be on a perfectly flat concrete slab so there could be a very slight misalignment there and you're, you're certainly not going to bend a two inch steel pipe over a matter of a couple inches to uh, compensate for that so having some flexibility in that connection is nice and it does have the temperature pressure ratings. Uh, I believe that that fitting, I believe, is well over 200 degrees, and I think it's rated up to about 70 p psi pressure. Uh, so again, a couple uh, tanks put together in close coupling. Here's uh, here's three of them. Now this is a different arrangement. Uh, these are tanks that are close together, but they're using a header system. And again, you've got the supply header up at the top. And you've got return header down at the bottom here. Collectively, you could look at this as a two pipe configuration. Just imagine you could take the three tanks and just kind of squish them together into one big tank. Uh, I do show balancing valves on here. Uh, even though we've got somewhat of reverse return, uh, balancing valves are, are going to do a dual duty there as well. If you did have to isolate a tank and remove it, it is possible to do it with this configuration. That is one limitation of this configuration. If for some reason, and it's unlikely, it's highly unlikely, but if you did have to remove a tank, you do have to shut this system down and, and at least do some temporary repiping. Over here would be possible to isolate, let's say this tank uh, with the units and with the right space planning, remove that tank if necessary, okay? So you can see there's a lot of versatility with, with this kind of a design. I'd love to see some manufacturers uh, look at products like this. I do believe that these tanks are, are going to continue to have a, um, a segment of the market, especially with electric thermal storage, any type of biomass boiler application, uh, potentially with heat pumps. Uh, with off-peak rates, although the temperature differentials we can work with with the heat pump are a lot narrower than with electric resistance elements. Uh, solar thermal, as Robert was mentioning, would be another application for these. And um, combined heat and power systems would be another application where we're dumping some extra heat from our, um, our combined heat power unit. And uh, again, those can go up to fairly high temperatures. Okay.
John, on the uh, generously sized headers, are we talking about velocities like less than two, one and a half feet per second type of stuff? Two feet per second. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd go with two feet per second on it, Robert. That that will give you reasonable entrainment of air bubbles, especially in a vertical pipe. Uh, if it's a horizontal pipe, you probably could go larger, but generally two feet per second has been a pretty good number to work with. Yeah. Uh, Remember, what we're trying to do here, we're trying to minimize our pressure drop along these headers. We're, we're trying to create a flow path through all three tanks that is as appealing through any one of those tanks as it is through another tank. Um, before I leave this, one other detail. I, I'm showing a, what I call a delta P valve. Most of us know this as differential pressure bypass. It's important to have that, if, if we, especially on a two-pipe configuration. I, I should say on a two pipe configuration, actually with a four pipe, you don't need it. It's there to prevent water and it's a little hard to see it in this application. Let me just see if I can go back. Um, here we go. One of, the, one of the reasons or the primary reason this is here We'd like to think that this cool water coming back from the load is intelligent enough that it knows to go this way, up through the tank and then back up. But water's tricky stuff. And if this, and I'm showing a little check valve in this circulator. Now remember, the check valves in these circulators are pretty weak. Uh, they're roughly a third to half a PSI for forward opening, okay? So if we're developing a pressure differential between this T and this T that's more than, let's say, half a PSI, and that's primarily because of the connections here and, and the turn and the T. Uh, what's going to happen is some of that cool water is actually going to go back up through this heat source when the heat source is off. We don't want that. That's going to cause losses from the heat source. And as that water cools down, remember, that water is actually going to mix in right here with some of the other flow going through the tank. And that's going to bring the water temperature, the mix temperature down. So we could put a check valve here. And I would tell you, if, if somebody has a check valve that has a forward opening resistance of, let's say, one PSI or maybe one and a half, that would be ideal. That could be used here. I cannot find that product on the market at this point. Uh, there are inserts that could be used in circulators like this. but contractors typically cannot buy these in small quantities. They're, they're mass produced and um, they're just not available as an over-the-counter type of item. But a differential bypass valve set for about one PSI, and that's about the lowest setting that these uh, valves go down to, that will take the place of a check valve and provide enough forward opening resistance so that we don't get this heat migration. And, and again, this is a phenomena that's associated with the two-pipe tank. On larger systems, you could use a motorized valve here, and you could use the end switch on a motorized valve to turn on the circulator and so forth. But on the smaller systems, uh, a differential bypass valve is, is a good option. All right. Um, and I don't want to run into Robert's time here too much, but I'm going to just finish up real quick. Interior air-to-water heat pumps. This is an interior air to water heat pump. It's made over in the Czech Republic. Uh, you're probably looking at that large flex duct and wondering what, what in the world is this thing? But well, it's pretty simple. It's bringing outside air in through a large insulated duct. This is the air handler section right here. And then the compressor and the remainder of the refrigeration components are over here. In the heating mode, we're gonna take heat out of that outside air. And then we're going to discharge the cool air back out through another louver. So we're simply bringing outside air in, running it through an air handler section and a heat pump, and then sending it back outside again. Um, you can actually see the piping connected here. Um, these are some different configurations for bringing outside air in and discharging it back outside. The key idea, we don't want these connections right next to each other because we're gonna short circuit. We're gonna get some of the discharge air just basically rolling back into the intake duct. And just another shot of it. Again, you can see here's the air handler section with a blower and a large coil. 
And then the components uh, for the, the uh, refrigeration system are over here. Um, this is showing it in a, a partially backfilled basement, conveniently showing the uh, air uh, intake and outlet above grade. All right. So another product, this is made in Germany. It's by a company called Glen, Glen Dimplex. And uh, I want to show you, it's an air handler section up at the top. So again, it's an axial flow fan. It's a coil. And then the refrigeration components are down here. Typical European design, the buffer tank is built in, the expansion tank is built in. And this is interesting. This is where it's applied in a corner of a building. So the ducting is very, very minimal here. We basically bring air in, run it right through the air handler and then send it right back out. And obviously not every building is going to lend itself to this, but uh, one of the things this company does is that they allow that air handler section to be reconfigured for either a 90 degree turn or a straight through pass. Um, here's, uh, here's another 90 degree configuration here, air coming in, discharge, air is a few feet away. Here's a couple grills. One's intake, one's out, output. This one I'm not too excited about in climates where I live and probably where Robert lives. Uh, these are actually the air intake and discharge grills on the ground. Um, I can just see things other than air going in there. Snow, bugs, mice, grass clippings, you name it. But uh, it does show an application where they've um, you know, they set it up that way. And I'm gonna finish, this is my last slide. What you're looking at here on the wall is a, a, a nominal five kilowatt, which would be what? Maybe about 17,000 BTU per hour, air to water heat pump. That wall mounts, and you can see the two ducts that come up from the top and go out through the outside wall. There's a, there's a kind of an exploded view of it. Again, air handler section up here, refrigeration components down below, piping comes out the bottom. This is roughly the size of a, maybe a, a 250,000 BTU per hour wall hung boiler, but it's, it's nowhere near 250,000. There's, there's another install. And you know, here's, a, here's a grill system they designed. If you look at the louvers, you'll see the louvers are angled at different um, different geometry there, trying to minimize any mixing of that air. And here's one of the um, schematics. This again is by a company by the name of Hot Jet. It's in the Czech Republic. Um, I do not read Czech. So, um, and it's a little hard to read it here anyway, but I, I did put this in to show you, this is set up with a diverter valve so that it can do domestic water heating as well as space heating, okay? So, uh, and it, it does have an inverter compressor, so it has a fairly wide range of capacity control. I think it's a perfect fit for a passive house or net zero house uh, mm -hmm. where we've got a low load situation and we wanna bring the efficiency of a modern air source heat pump and combine it with the comfort of hydronics. Uh, I think that's a market that we need to go after more net zero and possibly the passive house market. Here's a product, uh, again, unfortunately, I, I don't know that this is available in North America at this point, but it's, it does exist and uh, would love to see some other options letting us get into that market. And that's it for me, Robert. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna turn the show over to you. Great, thanks, John. I uh, always love your stuff and uh, you know, the, the, the trend for higher performance housing, of course, has been building up steam, uh, no pun intended, um, you know, over the last few years. And I, you know, I when I know when I graduated back in 1983, that was sort of the beginnings of it all. And uh, we've started to see it really mature in various marketplaces. So very low mm -hmm. loads and that piece of equipment certainly lends itself uh, well to that industry. Um, so yeah, thanks uh, again for all of the attendees that uh, participate in this uh, summit. And again, uh, also just to uh, echo Doug's uh, comments on uh, Wiesman sponsoring the event. I have to share a little story for you. I don't want to take up too much time, but at one time I worked for a company that I ultimately ended up buying uh, 
which was a distributor of uh, Wiesman boilers, and we won an award for the most boilers sold, and I think we sold three that year. <laughs> and that, so that goes that goes back almost three decades. So that tells you a little bit about Wiesman. I mean, people think of it as a European uh, company, but it's been in North America uh, as long as I've been in the industry. So, and you can see my gray hair. So that says that says something about it. Um, so my topics really have to do a lot with um, indoor environmental quality, but also how does hydronics play into that? And so these are the three subjects that we're going to tackle uh, in this year's uh, segment of uh, Siggy and the Bean. So we'll get into the first one, which is uh, dealing with uh, integrated uh, kitchen exhaust and make it fair using the HRV. So if you think traditionally uh, looking at kitchen e exhaust systems, um, you know, we don't want to depressurize the house. Uh, there are certain tolerances, certainly within Canada, you know, we can go to minus five, minus 10 pascals uh, without being too much of a concern. Uh, once you get down into the below minus 10 pascals, then you have to start being concerned about uh, soil gases and this type of thing being introduced into the home. Uh, we can actually get a little bit more aggressive on intermittent uh, depressurization down into the minus 50 pascals, but we don't want to have sustained depressurization. So we need to put in makeup air units when we get into some of these larger uh, range hoods, which we do see in the bigger houses for sure. Um, so this is more of the traditional route, but when you use this traditional route, you're still looking at how do we ventilate the home. And of course, in Canada, that's a mandatory requirement. And so a few years ago, we started to look at incorporating the HRV or ERV and using it actually as our makeup air unit. And we did that by disabling the exhaust air fan. And so by disabling the exhaust air fan on the HRV or ERV and just allowing the supply air fan to work, then we've converted basically the heat recovery ventilator into a makeup air unit. And so the function is, is that whenever the kitchen range hood uh, kicked on, the exhaust fan and the HRV was shut off, and then we drew in outdoor air into the HRV. Well, of course, for us here in the cold climate, you simply just can't dump uh, such large volumes of air. And we're talking oftentimes here volumes of air that are going to exceed 300 CFM, could get up to easily 1200 CFM in some of these big kitchens. Uh, so we don't want to be dumping that amount of cold air into a space, so we have to temper that. And of course, hydronics uh, is a perfect uh, tool to condition mm -hmm. that air, and so we're going to put, be using you know glycol coils. I just want to draw attention to that is that you know, and we've, we've written about this before, and John I know has used the same mm -hmm. principles is that when we get into these lower uh, temperature hydronic systems, heat pumps is a good example of that that your coils have to be designed uh, using a, what's called a lower log mean temperature difference. So you're going to end up with upsizing the coils uh, considerably. But that upsize cost is a one-time capital cost uh, where the low temperatures that you're using in these systems, either low temperature on the return of a condensing boiler or, of course, on the heat pump, that's you get the lifetime benefits of that. So you're not talking about just you know, the one-time capital cost is, a, is, a, is the pain part of it, but the pleasure part of it is that you get a lifetime of higher performance efficiencies. So when we do or did these types of systems, when I was practicing, um, we often uh, looked at you know, how do we uh, use the low temperatures with these glycol coils for makeup air using HRVs and it was, and it was upsizing the coils. So I'm going to show you a little case study here. Um, on the bottom left is actually the assembly. Uh, you can see there's the hood here, and then we actually, you know, were able to do these large systems, you know, 1,000 CFM exhaust that were incredibly quiet. Now, one of the dangers with large kitchen exhaust systems, if they're not done right, is they become noisy, and then the occupants won't use them. And what we did always you know, with our clients is we actually did not use packaged uh, exhaust hoods. We actually custom made our own. We located the exhaust fan oftentimes 20 to 30 feet away uh, from the range itself. And, and then this is a good example where the fan itself was actually located up near the roof and it was about 20, 30 feet away. But we also used silencers uh, on, the, uh, on the assembly, the ducting assembly. And so 
With the combination of moving the fan away, uh, the silencers, reduced amount of fittings, we could be drawing uh, easily 1200, 1100 CFM through a properly designed hood and you could barely, barely hear it. And of course it worked really well. On the right hand side is just sort of a plan view of the assembly. What you're looking at here in the hatched area is the coil itself. So the air would come into the coil, preheated before it hit the HRV and then distributed out into, into the home. And uh, so this is what it looked like. This was uh, a custom made hood. And again, there's a science to designing the hood. Um, this actually had a very deep sump. So when you think about a deep sump, think about in terms of a Dutch oven and turning the Dutch oven upside down. You want a large volume of air uh, where the products of combustion from a gas stove or also from the cooking itself, even with an induction type, rises up with the natural buoyancy of the air, gets captured within the deep sump, and then of course the exhaust fan takes it away. And uh, with this type of an assembly, uh, it's very, very effective and again, very, very quiet. And as a result, it gets used a lot uh, as opposed to being avoided due to noise. And then there's the, the uh, installation itself. So you can see here, very large uh, surface area heat exchanger uh, so that we can uh, take advantage of the low temperatures and making sure that we're getting reasonable air or pickup, temperature pickup on the discharge. And then it comes uh, out through the HRV. So this, when the kitchen range isn't operating, is performing as it would in any kind of a heat recovery ventilator or energy recovery ventilator. It's extracting warm, stale air out of the house, bringing cold air in, and then of course uh, through the core itself doing the conditioning. And then whenever it's switched over to the kitchen, then the makeup air coil kicked in. So my challenge with this, and this is one of the things that I, in terms of what I'd like to see, is I'd like to see more coordination uh, with the range hood uh, equipment providers and their HRVs. We always ended up having to do custom control systems, sort of mucking around with the HRV electronics. And the challenge is, is that some of the range hoods uh, used multi-speed, some used variable speed, and some of the HRVs used multi-speed and some had variable speeds. And trying to find the match between the variable Exhaust and the variable makeup air was always a challenge for us. So for those that are doing this type of equipment, if you're listening, uh, it would be great to see those coordinated controls between exhaust and makeup air. Um, the this particular mechanical system was kind of interesting for this project. Uh, may have actually talked about this before, but in our design, we ended up in the original design with a common one single temperature that did everything: space heating. Uh, supplemental heating, there was a large area that needs some supplemental heating, we used trench heaters for that, plus two coils for makeup air, and uh, it was an elegant system because all we had was the boiler plant um, with its independent circulator and then a primary secondary and just one circulator, and uh, as many of you people know, uh, I'm a huge fan of thermostatic radiator valves. Uh, as John has talked about before, they're the very first wireless control. Yeah. They're bulletproof. You can get them anywhere, um, and so towards the latter part of my my career, uh, even in the most high-end homes, we used thermostatic radiator valves, and as a result of that, we also had pressure bypass valves. So this was an, an incredibly elegant and simple system. One temperature, one circulator on the heating system, all thermostatic radiator control valves, um, and a pressure bypass valve, and that was it, and it did everything. Until the owner um, approved the removal of some exterior insulation, which completely changed our design. And we in fact had to go back and do a redesign. And of course, what that did is it complicated the mechanical system. So instead of having a single low temperature system, the loads in the building changed. And as a result, our temperature profiles changed. So we had to do a redesign on the mechanical system. And so we ended up with multiple temperatures and we used a system that uh, John, I think you've used quite a bit in the past, sort of these bridges, which allows mm -hmm. you to have a constant supply temperature across your distribution manifold, but variable temperatures within your heating terminal units. Uh, and in this case, we had multiple temperatures for the low temperature radiant in the concrete, in the uh, concrete areas of the house, a little bit higher temperature for the uh, wood floor systems upstairs, and then we had a temperature for our uh, coils in our air handlers and then also higher temperature for the domestic water tank. So instead of having, you know, 
a boiler with an outdoor reset control and a single pump and thermostatic radio valves, all of a sudden we end up with this complexity, more cost on the capital end um, as a result of that decision. Anyways, it was an interesting project. Um, it still is comfortable, but it's been penalized for the life of the building for the higher energy you know, because of it, unfortunately, but that was the consequence. Anyways, the next one I want to talk about has to do with source control in the design of radiant floor heating systems and ventilation systems. And, you know, John, this has been a pet peeve of mine for a long, long time, particularly in Alberta here, but also across Canada, because within our stand data, for those that are here in the province, uh, in the stand data, there's a requirement uh, that we address ventilation systems. And part of the ventilation requirements, both in the ASHRAE standards and in the CSA standards, is source control. And now people go, well, what the heck is source control? What we're talking about is where do the particles and the gases come uh, from inside the building that contribute to bad air quality and where those particles and gases can come from is actually the interior finishes and particularly flooring. Flooring that is synthetic or flooring that has glues and adhesives in it that are subjected to uh, temperatures and humidity and air velocities and the amount of that outgassing is a function of things like floor surface temperature, which is tied directly to the radiant system. So, you know, we have documents, uh, for example, I'm gonna go back here for a second. Uh, our Canadian government through NRC, IRC, the Institute of Research and Construction has done a fair amount of research work looking at outgassing uh, VOC emissions, volatile organic uh, compounds or chemicals, if you want, from architectural coating. So we're talking about anything that has to do with the interior finishes. So paints, flooring, whatever, um, you know, our sub, the outgassing is subjected to temperatures and humidities and air velocities. And so there is an actual tool that our government provides free of charge. It's relatively easy to do. It allows you to build a space uh, comprised of various architectural coatings and finishes and you can set up the ventilation systems and you can model the emission rate. So now what I did here is I just took one particular sample and, and what you're looking here on the right hand side, and I appreciate the text is small here, but these are this is the souffle uh, or the smorgasbord of chemicals that come, this particular one is off of just a random selected carpet, synthetic carpet. And uh, on the right hand on the left hand side is the quantity of gases that come out, and on the bottom, the x-axis is the time. So on the initial first few hours, you get a high, uh, high amount of outgassing, and then of course it dissipates. But some chemicals will continue to dissipate for long past you know any sort of uh, if you will, a sort of a ventilation process where they open up the house and they flush it out. Um, you can get outgassing that occurs for months and months and months. So this is for carpet, and you can see the value on the left. It's just a little bit over one. If we look at sort of more of a uh, uh, like a vinyl uh, linoleum, it reduces the amount of um, output down quite low compared to the carpet, and we've reduced the amount of uh, chemicals as well, and you can see that, or we can look at, um, oh sorry, this one, that one actually was for the hardwood, this is for the, the linoleum, and then this was for the carpet, so carpet, linoleum, and then hardwood, and so we go from one down to point one. so you know, and so why this is important is that when, when you're designing particularly radiant systems, if you can work with the interior designer, to have to show the consequences of them selecting synthetic materials which have a higher output of chemicals at a higher temperature or higher humidity and get them to use more natural materials then not only do you um, reduce the temperature requirement for your radiant system because the materials tend to be more conductive you also then improve the efficiency of the heating and cooling plant but you also then reduce the problems associated with indoor air quality so never underestimate the power of an interior designer because they have efficiency consequences, but also air quality consequences, but also thermal comfort consequences. So I, this is just one example where we set up um, the uh, schedule for ventilation here. Let me get to this. And let's see, there it is there. There's the room. There's the ventilation schedule. 
and you can just program operation time during what days and what uh, minimum and maximum uh, ventilation requirements are and then you can do the simulation and it'll tell you what the chemical souffle is based on that output so this this really needs to hit um, the designers uh, radar screens because particularly in the last few years there's been a number of papers research lo papers looking at and you can see the title of here this is VOC emissions which is an air quality concern but as it relates to radiant systems which is a comfort concern so you can't separate the two the occupant in the space is going to be subjected to the radiant system that you're designing but if your radiant system is operating at a high temperature there's a high probability that you've actually uh, increase the VOC emission rates from some types of fluorine systems. So please um, don't ignore that uh, because we're talking about the health and safety of the clients that we're actually doing design work for. And then here's another one that was looking at um, VOCs and other compounds. Uh, we do know, particularly John in the US, this is going back now probably uh, eight, nine years ago that there was a number of imported uh, uh, laminated flooring systems um, that had a high level of formaldehyde entered the California marketplace and of course the numbers were nowhere near the compliance values um, millions and millions of square feet of this product ended up in in the community and of course there was lawsuits that were filed as a result of it so uh, we can't trivialize these elements they're incredibly important so source control hey, Robert, yeah quick question um, have have any of the researchers looked at outgassing uh, in spaces that have used radiant ceilings rather than floors? I, I assume there's still some effect, but not that direct heating of the you know a slab under a carpet, for example. Just curious. Yeah. So that would be an interesting one, John. I don't think there has been any research from the ceiling down, but most radiant ceiling systems would be operating with sort of in, within a long range radiation as opposed to a short ray radiation and why I say that not because of the comparison between the floor and the ceiling well, the floor would be direct but I would suspect that we would get higher outgassing from flooring in sunlight coming mm -hmm. through the window than we would get from a radiant ceiling coming down and that's why yeah. the only reason I mention it but it would be a great research project for sure to take a look yeah. at that yeah absolutely and that's also why you know we're not we won't have time in this particular segment uh, but why integrated design is so important because if we have large window to wall ratios and as you know that creates huge problems for us from an energy and ethanol comfort problem but also lighting problems sound problems but because of also the amount of shortwave radiation entering the space can also create indoor air quality problems through the volatility the act the activation of these chemicals as a result of the high intensity radiation that comes through glazing systems, right? So you can't separate it, right? You have to look at all of it. That's what integrated design is all about. All right, so um, so when we talk about flooring, if we can stay with the more conductive floors, these tend to be more natural materials, the masonry type, so tile, slate, terrazzo, concrete, uh, these floors tend to be very hygienic relative to other types of floors. They also tend to uh, have much better fire separation. I, I know Murray Pound's going to be speaking in the conference. Of course, Murray has done amazing things when it comes to fire protection in housing. Uh, he's a, uh, I think he still is involved in training firefighters. I know he moved from Alberta out to the east. Murray, bad decision. Come on back. We miss you. <laughs> um, but you know, these floorings provide these benefits, and because they're also conductive, they have a better temperature profile, better thermal profile for heat pumps and boilers and whatever our mechanical systems are. So really have to um, encourage people to look at the uh, working with interior designers to make sure that we get these better materials on our floors if we can when we're doing radiant flooring systems. The other one I talk about is that how radiant or hydronics specifically is an, en is an enabler uh, of dedicated ventilation systems. John, I, you know, again, like both of us have been in the industry for more than three decades, probably going on four decades, if we actually were honest. <laughs> um, and, you know, so many times we've heard people say, well, you know, when you go to a forest air system, you don't need dual systems like you have to with a hydronic. When you go hydronic and you have to have a separate ventilation system, a separate heating system, that's not a negative. That's a positive. 
um, when you get when you start to understand ventilation systems that are dedicated, as we're now experiencing with the pandemic, because when people watch this, you know that from years to come, that'll be historic. This will be in the archives. This, we're during a pandemic, and ventilation systems uh, that are rendered inoperable because of a thermostat setting. Right, so mm -hmm. lots of houses have thermostats, and when those thermostats are satisfied, they're shutting down the the fans that's moving the air uh, that's you know being filtered. Well, that's a dysfunctional system, in my opinion. And what hydronics does, it allows that ventilation system to run continuously, always yeah. cleaning the air. And so it's not a negative; it's a positive, and we the industry really needs to embrace that. So. Um, a couple of messages there on that is that you know we we don't uh, breathe through our skin, and we uh, you know as a primary path in terms of thermal comfort, um, it's all done you know through our skin where respiration is done through our lungs. So we have a separate body systems that deal with thermal comfort and a separate body system for respir respiratory systems, and that really is important when we look at indoor environmental quality. And so when we talk about IEQ, we're not talking specifically air quality. That's another one of my soapboxes. When we talk mm -hmm. IEQ, we're talking about all of the sensory systems. Air quality is not a proxy for IEQ, which is often a misunderstanding. Uh, it's all of these sensory systems. And when you begin to understand that lighting is separate from sound and sound is separate from vibration and air is separate from thermal comfort, uh, that they are separate body systems, but the brain actually ultimately in, in, uh, integrates that. So they're independent, but they're also symbiotic. And so the body has a separate system for thermal, it has a separate system for air. And there's also separate standards. So we have a separate standard for air quality, which is ASHRAE 62, uh, 0.1 and 0.2 for commercial and residential systems, or uh, CSA F326. And then we have a separate standard for thermal comfort, which is ASHRAE standard 55. So the body has separate systems. We have separate standards for it. Uh, it's only when we get into the field and through economics, people try to get one system to do everything. And as we're experiencing again in the pandemic, it's a dysfunctional system. We need to go back to separating these systems out. And so that's, you know, that's a big message for us. And so we have dedicated ventilation systems. They're perfect for decontamination, deodorization, and uh, dehumidification or humidification. They're great for dealing with air issues. Not so much on the comfort side. Comfort is great when you incorporate the enclosure, the architecture, the enclosure design with the radiant systems. And so a separate system for thermal comfort, separate system for ventilation, and it's a beautiful, beautiful symbiotic system. And one of the best um, uh, stories to tell about that had to do with RUP. And a few years ago, some of their young engineers, and for those who may not be familiar with RUP, uh, RUP is one of the world's leading architectural engineering companies, and their young engineers were given a budget uh, to demonstrate uh, some of the advanced um, drafting and design tools. And so they created this project OV, and the project OV, OV was the name of the founder of RUP. And the, the task was, was to design a building that looked like a human being. And this building was as big as any building that you see anywhere around the world. So, you know, if you think about, you know, the Eiffel Tower, for example, you know, it was taller than that. It was, you know, full scale. I don't remember how many stories. It was probably 40 some odd stories. This design, of course, it'll never get built. But the idea was to represent that the building systems, the architectural systems, are, are similar in terms of the body system. So the air handling system was the respiratory system. The nervous system was the control systems. The uh, cardiovascular systems were the heating and cooling pipes and the plumbing system, you know? And the bones, of course, were the structure. And so the body already provides guidance on how we should do HVAC systems, separate system for ventilation, separate system for thermal comfort. The body systems are independent. Codes and standards are independent. And when we do good design, as ARUP did with their project of, everything also was independent, but it's symbiotic as it's one of an entire system. And of course, the brain does that. So that's um, you know one of the beautiful things about 
hydronics is it is an enabler it allows us to do the decontamination which is really important now when we're talking about pathogens uh, humidity and dehumidification of course is done through the air handling systems deodorization if we're getting into odors particularly around fires where we end up with the smells of burnt materials you know and we have carbon based filters uh, activated carbon but also uh, potassium magnate filters as well for controlling some of the other odors and you know anytime we shut these systems off because of a thermostat setting the thermostat is not an air quality control device it's a thermal control device and so the two of them should never operate anyways together i never, I never understood that since 1983 john and you were probably the same like i always was taught that we don't combine these systems ever I never did one system in my entire life where they were combined. We always treated them separately, you know? And our clients now today are benefiting from that. All those years, 30, 40 years of work that we did designing separate systems are now, these people are, and commercial spaces are benefiting hugely because of that, that philosophy. So hydronics is not a disabler. It doesn't, it's not a negative thing. It's in fact an enabler. And it's one of the things that we need to do as an industry is to really promote that benefit. So my three things, again, you know, we need more coordination between exhaust and makeup air with kitchens and then using large oversized coils so we can take advantage of these low temperature systems. Get rid of the complications, right? If you can, go to a single temperature system. Teach people to use the tools that are available to us as designers when it comes to source control. You know, hydronic design is only one part of indoor environmental quality. It's the thermal comfort side of it. Obviously, there's an energy component to it too as well, but we also have to think about the occupants and making sure that we're not promoting or encouraging more outgassing from heated surfaces than, than we have to, and that we ought to look at hydronics as an enabler when it comes to separating ventilation systems from thermal comfort systems. So that really is my sort of my three things. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Doug. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. So once again, Ziggy and the Bean strike. Uh, thank you both so much for sharing the things you'd like to see. So I'm just going to run it, run it down. Vapor tight insulation, universal buffer tank design, indoor air to water heat pumps. Look for those. Uh, integrated kitchen exhaust with HRV ERV systems. Enforcement of source control and design of radiant floor heating and ventilation systems to address off-gassing of interior finishes. And Robert, you said, never underestimate the power of an interior designer. I know my wife is going to like that line. You also <laughs> said, embrace your interior designer, and yeah. she, she will enjoy that as well. Yep. So thank you for that. And of course, promote hydronics as an enabler of the positives of dedicated ventilation systems. Guys, thank you so much. Again, I'd like to thank our session sponsor for this one, Beesman. And really that, uh, we're close to wrapping up the 2021 Modern Hydronic Summit. The only thing left for us is to announce the winner of the 2021 Sweet Heat Contest. We're gonna be heading over to the final session to see those results revealed very soon. And just to let everyone know, all of the all of the sessions of the 2021 Modern Hydronics Summit and the exhibit hall will be available for revisiting for at least another two months. So come back often to see what you may have missed and even watch sessions like this one again and again. So once again, thank you, Siggy and the Bean. And thank you all for attending, and we'll see you at the Sweet Heat Reveal. Bye for now. <laughs>